Hi, I'm Nicola Jennings, one of the co-founders of Athena Art Foundation. This is Athena Asks, a podcast where we talk to artists, curators, historians and collectors about their work, pre-modern art and the world today. Today, it's my pleasure to hand over the podcast to Dr. Adrian Childs, with whom I've co-curated the exhibition The Colour of Anxiety, Race, Sexuality and Disorder in Victorian Sculpture at the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds. The exhibition looks at the incorporation of colour into British sculpture in the mid-19th century in relation to Victorian anxieties about social change, race and scientific advances like Darwin's theory of evolution. It's a small exhibition designed to get people looking at works which have fallen out of fashion and in some cases been brought out of storage and especially to provoke debate about late Victorian sculpture and issues surrounding race, sexuality and social change. Adrian is adjunct curator at the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C., and an associate of the W.E.B. Dubois Research Institute at the Hutchins Center at Harvard University. Adrian's numerous publications include Blacks and Blackness in European Art of the Long 19th Century, which she co-edited in 2014, and a current project about the Black figure in European decorative arts. Her many exhibitions include Rifts and Relations, African-American Artists and the European Modernist Tradition, which was held at the Phillips Collection in 2020. Adrian is joined by Dr. Mia Barneris and Dr. Caitlin Mihe beach Mia is Associate Professor in Art History and Africana Studies and Director of the Africana Studies Programme at Tulane University in New Orleans. Her book, Colouring the Caribbean, Race, and the art of Agostina Brunias was published in 2018. And she has another co-edited book coming out next year entitled Reframing Black Art, in uh, inverted commas, Case Studies in 19th Century Visual Culture. Caitlin is Assistant Professor, Art History and Faculty Affiliate, African and African American Studies at Fordham University in New York. Caitlin's first book, Sculpture at the Ends of Slavery, will be published this year. So Adrienne, Welcome, and I'm just going to hand over, as I say, to you. Well, thank you very much, Nicola. I was really delighted that you asked me to join you in this really exciting project. Uh, The reemergence of color in Victorian era sculpture has many roots and many branches, right? One of the results of this widening of the possibilities of, of the materials of sculpture was that artists began to look to subjects that incorporated not only color, but people of color. And there was actually at that time, I feel like a very slim history of representing non-whites in European sculpture. And so you get a sort of an interesting proliferation of sculpture that depicts people, men and women of color. So um, the interest in depicting black and brown people does not happen right in a vacuum, right? It goes in tandem with sort of political and cultural issues that often are tethered to slavery and its slow demise over the 19th century, right? Slavery is one of the major issues uh, of that time and also inflected by colonialism and imperialism as white Europeans seek to dominate people of color across the globe. So looking across the board at many works of art, Nicola and I realized that there was a critical mass of objects that depicted enslaved women of color during this time. And when you think about it, um, it seems like an unlikely subject for the reserved Victorians, right, who place so much value on whiteness. And these works are complex and often carry conflicting messages. So my two friends and colleagues here today, Mia and Caitlin, have examined the ideas that animate these women of color in sculpture and literature and more. And they have fleshed them out with what I really think is brilliant critical thinking. And I'm delighted to have you both in this conversation. So I think the first topic we'll tackle is the work of John Bell, who both of you have written about. So Caitlin, tell me about John Bell. Right. Yeah. So John Bell is a British sculptor working in the 19th century, creates a very large and varied body of work. Um, He's a white British man born at the beginning of the 19th century, 1811, and trains in London at the Royal Academy Schools. And what's interesting is that the dates of his career really sort of parallel the reign of Queen Victoria. So he really starts to get going um, in the 1830s and early 1840s with collaborations with industrial manufacturing firms that are making reproductions of art. So he works with Elkington, Minton, Colebrookdale, all these sort of giants of industry. 
And so he's really working at the acceleration of industry and then also Victorian empire with monumental works that, that Mia can also speak to. So John Bell is probably uh, most well known for sculpting the America Group that is part of the Albert Memorial in London. He came to my attention actually first for these lesser known uh, works of his uh, images of enslaved, shackled beauties, I call them. And as Caitlin mentioned, his work sort of gained a lot of popular exposure through his collaborations with industrial firms and through the reproduction of his work such that a middle-class person would be able to purchase a, a copy, a Parian Ware copy of something like the Octoroon or a version of A Daughter of Eve, uh, which are two of his works that represent enslaved women. Uh, but other works of his were also made available in this way, Uma and the Lion. But other works um, were also reproduced and, and made available. Um, you introduced okay. his works at Octoroon and uh, what we're calling what the, A Daughter of Eve. <laughs> um, and these are two of the major works I think both of you have written about. We do have the Octoroon in the exhibition, and we have a version of A Daughter of Eve in the exhibition that its name got changed as time went on. But I want to hear from you about exactly what these works are about. And I think that the daughter, A Daughter of Eve was the first of these two, and perhaps Octoroon may have been a response to that. Caitlin, your article focuses on A Daughter of Eve. Tell us about this work. Yeah, so A Daughter of Eve... Bell makes it in 1853, and he first writes about how he makes the sculpture specifically to draw attention to the problem of slavery in the United States. And so it's interesting to think about how he chose to do this, how he chose to show this visually, because he had produced sculptures of abolitionists before, but not of enslaved bodies. And Bell actually writes in a letter that he hoped to make a sculpture like Hiram Powers as Greek slave, but he makes several critical changes from the white marble body of the Greek slave. So he chooses to represent a black woman instead of a white woman. He chose to create the work in bronze rather than marble. And then he also chooses to create the work in collaboration with a manufacturing firm. And so all of these circumstances make for a work that gets displayed at world's fairs and international exhibitions is seen by a great number of people where people are asked to read the body of um, a captive woman, a captive Black woman whose arms are in shackles in relationship to the problem of American slavery in the year 1853, which is as the debates about abolition are heightening in the United States. So this problem then, as Bell interprets it, is kind of coming to the world stage uh, in a very visual way. Yes, it is. Now, had there been much scholarship critical scholarship on this work before you tackled it. And I know Mia has written some about it too. What did you bring to the discussion of this? So I, I had known of A Daughter of Eve through reproductions of the sculpture in books, but I ended up coming to thinking about the sculpture in a sort of circuitous way. It was watching um, the Black Audio Film Collective's film Hands Were Songs that I had encountered in a graduate seminar on Black British art. And Bell's work isn't obviously referenced in the film, but parts of the film deal with Birmingham and the West Midlands and that region's connections to 19th century histories of slavery and industry. And so there's this interesting passage where the montage goes between clips of heavy manufacturing and metal and chains and then stills of statues of white abolitionists in Birmingham. And so the oscillation between these two things kind of asks us to think about one in relationship to the other. So that's where I began to think about Bell in his work, which is an electrotype, a metal sculpture made by a Birmingham manufacturing company. And so there had been the excellent exhibition, Sculpture Victorious at the Yale Center for British Art, that um, I think really primed a lot of us well to think about the intersection of sculpture and Victorian manufacturing, particularly with Bell's work. And so I was likewise interested in sort of delving further into this in light of you know, the connections between art and industry and slavery. Um, so how you know, did, a, did a city like Birmingham, a city known for equipping the slave trade as well as you know, for abolitionist movements, come to produce a sculpture like this. So I was interested in thinking about these intersections. It's really interesting. Now, when I first saw this piece, I've, I since I've done work on Charles Cordier, the French artist who's working around the same time, I noticed he drew upon Cordier's treatment of the hair, uh, treatment of the earrings, even though this is 
polychromatic. It's so, in other words, he's using different materials that are in different colors. The earrings in bronze and this chains that look like they're silver to me. Um, sure. Add this sort of decorative dimension and uh, her sexuality. And so it's interesting that he's credited with being an abolitionist. And right. this is credited with abolitionist sentiments. It seems to f default to the sort of Black Venus narrative yes. we see coming out. And that seems to be a contradiction. Mm -hmm. uh, the contradiction is, is very subtle there, but I think it becomes more even interesting and complicated in his piece, The Octoroon, that Mia has taken on so beautifully. Mia, how does he get from the daughter of Eve to the Octoroon? What, what happens there? That's a terrific question, because uh, I have some speculations about literally what happened there. But also, I think that there were some really important material and ideological changes that happened between um, A Daughter of Eve and the Octoroon. So um, when Bell first exhibited A Daughter of Eve, he exhibited a plaster maquette which we can assume was probably either sort of white cream or at least not as dark as the bronze sculpture eventually was. And every time he spoke about it, and like almost every article said, it says to be rendered in bronze, clearly indicating that the bronze material was meant as a sort of a surrogate or to signify skin color. Though one of the early reviews of the Octoroon mentioned the figure as, I can't remember whether it's a half-caste weeping girl or a parti-colored weeping girl, uh, as though the reviewer, without the bronze material to clearly signify skin color, and with no prompting from, from Bell whatsoever, assumes that the figure is a mixed-race figure. To me, that kind of sparked a little light bulb in Bell's mind that uh, stuck with him that ultimately might have manifested in the Octoroon. But the Octoroon also has the change in materiality um, from bronze to marble came, uh, brought with it um, some important ideological changes in the significance of the work. You mentioned the sort of uh, ornamental quality of say the chains in the daughter of Eve and the earrings, things that were meant to amplify the exoticism of the work and relate it say to a work like Cordier's. For me, what the Octoroon does is try to replicate a lot of what is going on in Power's Greek slave in terms of signifying on all of the ideological associations with white marble, purity, beauty, and to do so with a figure of African descent, um, which was not able to be done in the same way with a daughter of Eve. However, this kind of translation does not perfectly work. As Charmaine A. Nelson reminds us, whenever you sort of change the racial identity of any figure, you change the meaning that that figure can have. And so this was kind of a repetition of Powers' and strategy of narration of the Greek slave with a critical difference. And that critical difference was the exotic, uh, so-called exotic racial identity of the Octoroon, which was seven parts white, the last part black. So that the narrative that this marble sculpture carried wasn't the same protective cloak that the Greek slave had, but instead the sort of tradition of sort of tragic octoroon stories that the British public knew well created a narrative for the sculpture that amplified its titillating qualities. The octoroon offered the opportunity for Bell to sculpt a figure that had all of the associations that sort of colored sculptures had, whether that be colored marble or tinted marble like Gibson's Tinted Venus or uh, the sort of exoticized bronzes and bejeweled bronzes of Cordier, but to do that in a white bronze figure. So it's kind of like the color of the octoroon is on the inside, if that makes sense. All of the qualities associated with Black female sexuality during the Victorian era, that sort of hypersexuality, is contained within this marble figure. Your discussion of the Octoroon expands to literature and the cultural imagination. And why do we think, both of you, I'm putting this to both of you, that enslaved women were so 
fascinating to this late Victorian audience. One of the really interesting things to me about the Octoroon is that although Bell did uh, conceive of it before the end of the Civil War, he doesn't sculpt it until after emancipation in the United States has already been accomplished, right? And so part of my interest in the enslaved mixed race beauty in the Victorian imagination really is how this figure and what kind of cultural work this figure does after 1865, when the tragic Octoroon is no longer um, a f her, her potential to work as a political tool in favor of abolition is moot, right? Because abolition has been accomplished already. Um, and I think part of the answer is very easy, right? It was an opportunity to have a titillating experience all under the guise of moral outrage, right? No longer useful moral outrage. Uh, it offered audiences a way to sort of indulge in their fantasies, particularly their fantasies of the bodies of women of African descent without necessarily having to feel guilty about it. But beyond that, I think that figures like the Octoroon also allowed British audiences to think of themselves as on the right side of history when it came to slavery. Caitlin mentioned the Elkington and Company, right, and its location, right, kind of in the heart of, of a city that had close ties um, and implications to the slave trade. Similarly, where the Octoroon ended up in Blackburn, uh, the center of the cotton uh, industry in England, also had a relationship to the slave trade. During the Civil War, right, that, that area experienced what was called the Cotton Famine. There were people out of work and the popular lore is that the cotton workers in England sort of cast their lot with enslaved African Americans and, and really supported the abolition of slavery and the North and the Civil War. There's even a sculpture, right, of Abraham Lincoln, right, in, in Manchester. And yet the historical record reveals that particularly in these small cotton towns, there were clubs that supported the South, that the sympathies were more divided, I'll say. And so when a town like Blackburn purchases a work like Bell's Octoroon as, you know, one of the first and, and star pieces for its newly established library, museum, and art gallery, it really makes a statement after the fact, right, that this town's sympathies were with enslaved African Americans and uh, supported the abolition of slavery. Yeah, no, I think that Mia's absolutely right in kind of thinking about the belatedness of a figure like the Octoroon and the ways that people are then kind of projecting fantasies about quote unquote exoticized bodies of women of color after emancipation. And I think one thing that is interesting to me is the fact that for some of these artists, the question of emancipation doesn't register as something to be monumentalized, um, or the question of abolition doesn't register as something to be monumentalized, but rather is an artistic question that is alighted in sculpture. And so then the the tradition of depicting an, a captive figure or an enslaved figure still holds after the abolition of slavery. And so why do artists not choose to change their practice in some way so as to reflect these larger historical shifts? And of course, here I am thinking of Anmonia Lewis's Forever Free, where in that sculpture, it was a priority for Lewis to depict people rising out of broken shackles in order to visually signify a free body rather than a captive body. And so and it's interesting to think kind of about whether artists in the 19th century are interested in being timely or timeless and kind of the different ramifications of that. That's interesting. The, this discussion has made me think of the American context of nostalgia, antebellum nostalgia, <laughs> after the war. It is almost used like a tool to keep people down. I know it's a different context there, mm -hmm. but these tropes of the beautiful uh, but tragic mulatto or octoroon and, and all the different Uncle Tom types and those typologies that were born out of slavery are even more distributed widely and deployed, you know, as a means of control in some ways. Just because it ends on this day doesn't mean it's over. I think mm -hmm. that's basically the lesson to be learned. 
these two sculptures <laughs> um, had a very uh, important life. What does it mean to have reductions that can go on your mantle? <laughs> and you, Mia briefly talked about it earlier and how it gives people uh, who could not buy and patronize sculpture the opportunities to own something like this. And what does it do to that story? Normalize, naturalize are words that I, I use. Caitlin, you've worked on this. Uh, what do you think is the, the result, I guess, the cultural result of, of so many re replicas? Sure. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really interesting question, especially as you're saying about kind of the naturalization or normalization of certain ideas or the entrenchment of ideas. And with the John Bell Daughter of Eve sculpture, it's, I believe it's Minton, the manufacturing company that sort of gives the sculpture a new name of the American slave. So they sort of begin to tie the sculpture to a specific historical and geographical moment, the moment of slavery, rather than kind of this more biblical title of a daughter of Eve, which is interesting. And of course, the question of miniaturization, I think I'm thinking of what Susan Stewart writes about to make something small and to miniaturize is to render it of a person. And so with miniaturizing something, it automatically brings into play, I guess, connotations of ownership that, of course, with a depiction of an enslaved body, um, cannot be ignored. Thinking about the space of the domestic and the home can be a space where these conversations may allow room for subversion of maybe some of these ideas about commodification or slavery, where in abolitionist context, certainly the parlor becomes a really heated space of discussion about um, the abolitionist movement. And so I'm mean, thinking about Jasmine Nicole Cobb's kind of discussion of the transatlantic parlor and how this becomes a real space for people to think about ideas. And of course, images, you know, whether daguerreotypes or prints or sculptures, small scale reproductive images become really important to helping sort of punctuate those conversations. And so I guess there can be sort of two different dimensions to this question of the commodification and reproduction. On the one hand, you have this history of objectification. On the other hand, you have a history that might work to counter that as well. And Mia, the uh, Minton Parian of the Octoroon is pure white as Parians would be. And Parian, for those who don't know, is a porcelain that is, is unglazed and it's it's got a little bit of texture to it. The surface is like biscuit porcelain as opposed to a very high shiny gloss on on some of the other pieces like the, the manacled slave bronze is very glossy and the i noticed that the octoroon the original piece is a marble that is a lot of sort of inclusions in it and flaws and, and and it's kind of dappled so what does that do to make the octoroon even wider um yes that was actually something that was that is much remarked upon if you look at the file um, for the Marlboro Arcturine Sculptor that is at the Blackburn Museum and Art Gallery. It is not a piece of, of pure marble. There are visible striations, um, particularly in the thigh and in the back, that one might think of as, a, as, as resonating, right, with her racial impurity. And that is not a feature of the Minton Perry and Ware miniature. There's some really interesting deviations in what we might consider when we think about a miniature of the Octoroon versus, say, a miniature of a daughter of Eve or what becomes uh, under Minton's title, the American Slave. And, and I think that the, the title is really important as one of those features. Um, if you'll notice in the sculpture of the, the full-size sculpture of Bell's Octoroon, the word Octoroon is um, carved into the base. And I talk a lot in my uh, article about that work, about literally there is a quote from a newspaper from the time that says, what a draw the word octoroon must have had. Because the idea of octoroons, there's such a, a fascination with them at that time. Dion Boussicot's octoroon play is, is playing. Um, there are other versions of the same story. Mary Elizabeth Braddon has a version of of the Octoroon Pale that runs in a half penny journal, a, a magazine for all who can read, right? So at every kind of class level, folks are familiar with this cultural figure. And unlike Bell's other miniatures that were made for Minton, the Octoroon is, I believe, the only one 
that also has the name engraved on the base. And that guarantees, right, that her narrative will accompany her miniature miscegenated figure, right? Because otherwise there's the opportunity to read it simply as a kind of generic beauty and bondage, right? That the racial element, the exoticism of the work is could be potentially lost without that title because the octoroon does not uh, sort of bear the traces of her African descent in her body in such an obvious way. Now there are important hints of that in the work, her, all of the deviations that exist between the octoroon figure and the Greek slave, her long hair um, that is unbound, the way that she looks at her figure regarding, so for example, her breast, which she moves her hair to reveal, all of the kind of rigid codes that typically governed authorized representations of the female nude during the Victorian era, the edited genitalia, these are kind of compromised or in some way sort of bent in the octoroon. And this is a very tactile sculpture, right? The wavy tresses make you want to touch it in a way. And the fact that she, in fact, touches her own hair and touches her own body, her hand almost being like a surrogate for the viewers, all of these things lend themselves particularly well then to the creation of a miniature, which you could actually handle, right? So unlike with the life-size figure where the viewer might imagine an overseer or um, an auctioneer directing the octoroon to, you know, move her hair to reveal her figure um, for folks at, an, at a slave auction, the viewer can actually do the touching when that figure is uh, 18 inches and available for purchase. And I think another important distinction is the fact that the octoroon in her narrative carries with it the idea, right, of, of sex for sale. That is that light-skinned mixed-race slave women uh, were particularly in Louisiana associated what was, with what was called the fancy trade, particularly in the popular imagination, and such that uh, these women were often understood to be purchased not necessarily for useful services, but for services in the slaveholder's bed, right? And so there is a way in which you are purchasing those people who purchased fancy girls, and uh, Walter Johnson talks about this, right? They are purchasing not something that's going to be practically useful, but something that will amplify uh, sort of white male uh, identity and power, right? The, I, the ability to buy something purely for one's pleasure, which is also what Victorian sculpture was largely seen as, right? Something that you would buy for your pleasure. So though it's important not to minimize for the sake of clever argument, uh, the difference between, you know, the buying of a work of art and the buying of an actual person, um, there's a kind of resonance between the purchase of the, of an octoroon, an actual fancy girl, for example, and uh, the sculpture or the period wear miniature in the sense that these were people who would have been seen as objects, right, that were purchased for the pleasure of their owners and would have amplified their status in a way that I think is different than the American slave. It's interesting to me that all of these pieces that we've talked about today, the octoroon, the manacled slave, the American slave, the sexuality that is being forefronted implicates the powerful white men who purchased them, who sold them, the way that the actual body of an octoroon is the result of forced sex, or however you might want to put it, with enslaved women over generations and generations. And this is something that it's rooted in English culture. It's rooted in European culture. The French, uh, the English, the Spanish, the presence of mixed race people is a direct result of that. And yet somehow they don't seem to have the same kind of culpability. <laughs> they don't see their own culpability of their own culture in producing this. And then it becomes a, a, a symbol of pathos, albeit complicated symbol of pathos. Um, that she is somehow being subjected to something that your culture has initiated. What did we do about that? I think the question is interesting because like both of the sculptures specifically are about 
slavery in the United States rather than slavery in the British Atlantic. And so as Mia was speaking to kind of this question of Britons in the 1860s, long after the transatlantic slave trade has abolished and Britain has abolished slavery in their empire, they're focusing on the problem of American slavery as it still exists as an institution. And then the moral outrage gets directed in that context while also alighting Britain's culpability in American slavery in relationship to industry, let alone Britain thinking about, you know, the period of apprenticeship in indentured labor that pers- that followed abolition. But it's interesting that kind of all the questions about slavery and the moral debates get relocated to not the British Empire. But the America is was part of the British Empire. I'm thinking of the fact that the British system of slavery is what before the revolution, which drove the American system. And it's and it, it's not new to, you know, post-revolutionary era. Sure. I feel like it goes back that far. And then, of course, mm-hmm. it's also mm-hmm. happening in, in the Caribbean, as you say. Runia's material is, that Mia has written on was very apparent mm-hmm. about that. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of anxiety about that, but it was also a, a source of sort of quaint, uh, I don't know if you call it picturesqueness of the mm-hmm. island. And it is a horrible testament to sexual violence against women. I think you're absolutely right, Adrienne. Britain certainly participated in and forced interracial sex with enslaved women. And yet I agree with Caitlin that when this is visualized and brought into visual culture, um, it's almost always done in a way that allows Britons to distance themselves and to kind of blame uh, miscegenation on someone else. Right. So even with the Brunius works that you mentioned, the ones that, for example, are at Harvard, they're French mulattresses. The idea that it's the French who are responsible for all of that race mixing who happened in the Caribbean, and we just inherited that. (laughs) And in the case of these 19th century sculptures, there is a real emphasis on the fact that these are representing the United States um, and not the British the current British Americas, particularly with the Octoroon, like the location is even more specific um, in that it represents the American South and and almost certainly the Louisiana. There are certain visual cues, particularly the magnolia flower that the figure holds. But the fact that all Octoroon tales have in their subtitles, almost all of them, Louisiana, the Lily of Louisiana, a tale of Louisiana. And that is because Louisiana was particularly associated with sort of the traffic in pretty women as sex slaves, which connected it to the idea of the Orient. So when you're talking about this sort of really unsavory American slaveholder, that becomes in the British imagination and in the larger, I think, abolitionist imagination, because this was also a a rhetorical strategy in, in the North, to equate the South in the United States during slavery with the Orient, with the idea of the harem. Thomas Wentworth Higginson said that something like, compared to an American plantation, a Turkish harem is a cradle of virgin purity. Right? There is the understanding that the idea of the sexuality of these figures, um, the idea of interracial sex, it was always displaced onto another location that wasn't right. Exactly. Well, you know, this has really been a wonderful conversation. I, we could go on forever. <laughs> Thank you guys very much for coming to talk about a few of the works that are, are in the color of anxiety. And I'd like to thank all three of you very much because that was a really fascinating conversation. I learned uh, so much about pieces that Adrian and I have been talking about. I know there's so much more we could say. Mm-hmm.